Welcome to Defense One State of the Navy. I'm Brad Penniston, Executive Editor, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Admiral Lisa Franchetti, Chief of Naval Operations. Admiral Franchetti, thank you so much for being here. Thanks a lot, Brad. It's great to be here with you today. And let me just say that I am really happy to be able to talk to you about the Navy today. You know, I could not be more proud of our Navy team or more focused on building the Navy that our nation needs to do all the missions that they count on us to do every single day. You know, as you look around the world, we're operating every day from seabed to space and the information environment, everywhere in between, all around the globe. And I could not be more proud of our sailors, both active and reserve, our civilians, and uh, also our families who support all that work around the world. You see our, our ships, our aircraft carrier, our aircraft operating today in the Red Sea, supporting and leading Operation Prosperity Guardian, a great coalition of nations that are really standing up for the rules-based international order as we work to preserve the free flow of commerce through the Red Sea, through the Babel Mandeb, and on into the Gulf of Aden. We also are in supporting efforts in uh, you know, the unified response to Ukraine and Russia's horrific invasion of that sovereign nation. I'm proud of our team that's working on that as well. And then you can see us working every day in the Indo-Pacific. You know, we just had the Theodore Roosevelt and the Vincent doing a large deck exercise with the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force. We have our team with the Marines doing exercises like Balikatan or Iron Fist with first the Philippines and then Japan. So again, we're building those partnerships that we need every single day. I think you also might have seen in January, I put out my priorities of warfighting, warfighters and the foundation that supports them. And I'm really looking forward to working across the team with all of our stakeholders to be able to do that over the next four years that I'm here as CNO. Well, thank you very much, Admiral. Let's start with warfighting then. And and I guess let's start uh, with the Red Sea, where unprecedented things have been happening. Missile duels between ships, uh, drones attacking U.S. ships. What lessons has the Navy learned so far from, from that, that theater of conflict? Well, you know, Brad, thanks for asking that question. And again, you know, this is one of those another important opportunities that our Navy has to learn and to uh, practice uh, innovation, I would say, you know, as we think about the things that we've seen in Ukraine and how the Ukrainians have been able to innovate uh, on the battlefield, you know, this is a lesson that we take seriously every day. So I'm really proud, again, of the ships that we see there. Um, you know, they are, again, supporting the rules-based international order. But as far as lessons go, I would probably talk about two. So first of all, you know, way back about nine years ago, we really did a transformation of our surface warfare community training. Uh, we set up weapons tactics instructors learning from our aviation community on uh, how to bring that tactical edge and experience uh, to the field. And now you see nine years later, as we've set up both those tactics instructors, we've set up reach back uh, to our warfighting centers and uh, to be able to really understand what's going on in the operating environment to be able to adjust tactics, techniques, procedures, uh, and then the training that we've been able to do both across all of our surface platforms, but how they integrate uh, with the carrier strike group and the air wing, and then the air force and the joint force. So you can see all of those things coming into play. So again, I think the investments that we made, they are really paying off and those great lessons that we're learning about how to innovate while we're out there in the same battle space. I think the second one is the real importance of logistics uh, again, I've focused a lot, especially as Sixth Fleet Commander, on contested logistics and the need to think creatively about how to resupply our ships that are out there on the pointy end. And uh, we've been able to do that. And I think we've learned a lot about logistics. As you know, we had to bring some of our ships out of the Red Sea originally uh, to be able to do some of the logistics things they needed to do. But now we've been able to work with allies and partners to be able to do that right on station and really keep everybody in the fight, cycling them off, getting their stuff reloaded, getting their fruits, vegetables, supplies, all the things that we need to do, and uh, be able to stay right there uh, in the battle. Well, I think uh, logistics is an area that doesn't get talked about enough. Uh, it's absolutely crucial, of course, to, to war fighting. Um, and you, you mentioned reach back and the things that the, the people back at home are doing. Um, it's got to be a tremendous effort to keep that, that force supplied and in the fight. What is that doing to uh, readiness in the rest of the, the force? Um, the, the service community is, you know, the logistics community. Yeah, you know, I like to think uh, back to something Secretary Austin said, you know, which is America is the most powerful nation in the world. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, I'm really proud of how our forces are set up across all of our different regions uh, to be able to respond 
and to be able to pull together to provide the resources we need to keep our operations going in each region. So, for example, we haven't decremented any of the work that we're doing in the Indo-Pacific, the Atlantic, in the Six Fleet AOR, the Mediterranean, the Baltic, and we're continuing to be able to operate in the Red Sea. So I think it's a real testament to the work that's been done in the past to enable us to do this work uh, now and into the future. Okay. Well, speaking of the future, um, and speaking of, of one of the striking uh, aspects of this particular conflict, uh, it is, you know, the Houthis have been throwing relatively cheap drones, and we're shooting them down with relatively expensive missiles. And it's an imbalance that you know, will only last, you know, we can't do it forever. Um, the, the promise has been that eventually directed energy will give us this kind of cheap magazine that we can use against cheap weapons. Uh, but recently, the Navy's efforts on directed energy um, have been, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not so much a focus anymore. Is that something that needs to be changed? Well, first, I would say, you know, you can't really put a price tag on the 300 sailors uh, that are on our DDG. So, you know, we are postured to do defense in depth. That's what we train to. So we have a lot of different capabilities at a lot of different layers. And again, I'm really proud of how the, the ships and the strike group out there are defending uh, not only ourselves, but also the merchant ships that are going through the Red Sea. Um, as far as I would like to say on the different technologies that we need in the future, it really is a focus. And I think if you look now across the joint force of how we're working together to think about all these different technologies and how we can improve, you can think back to uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia. You can look at the war in Ukraine. You see a lot of different unmanned technologies being used. So we know we need to have them. We also know we need to be able to defend against them. And uh, this is a great focus area for me. I think if you look at, we just stood up our disruptive capabilities office, looking at you know what are technologies that are out there that we can quickly scale and get into the hands of the warfighters uh, in terms of things like directed energy or other types of weapons that we might need to have in the future. There's a full core press uh, on in the R&D community to get those found, get them developed and get them out on our ships as quickly as possible. Well, Again, working with the joint force, you know, how do we leverage the capabilities of each one of the services to see maybe we could put something that another service has on one of our ships and get that capability employed very quickly? Oh, well, that's interesting. And you mentioned unmanned, and I, I would love to talk to you about demand for a little while. Let me just uh, go back to directed energy for, for one moment. Um, is Will it be necessary to, to increase the Navy's investment in R&D uh, on directed energy, or you think that uh, that you're already doing enough and, and possibly looking around the rest of the joint force, uh, you know, something will, will arrive that will, will, will fill the bill? Yes, I think, you know, we have a, a laser that we're testing right now. Uh, we're going to continue to work on that. But again, we do need to look across all the other services and what they're doing so we can partner together. I think that's going to be the most effective way to get something out as quickly as possible recognizing that things that we have in the land domain, uh, they may need to be adapted to the maritime domain, similarly maritime domain into the land domain. I think, again, great opportunity there. Okay. Well, let's talk more about unmanned then. Um, the Navy is, of course, uh, doing lots and lots of stuff with unmanned in uh, in in Fourth Fleet and Fifth Fleet uh, all around the force. Um, how do you take all of that innovation and you know, make sure it gets spread around. I mean, you've got to, you know, obviously you've got to let individual commands have room to run so they can innovate. But once they come up with an idea, how do you get that all through the Navy from, you know, from the operator to the to the acquisition force? Yeah, I'm really excited about unmanned technology. I think it can really expand the reach, uh, the lethality of our conventionally manned platforms. And I think during my time as CNO, this is going to be an area that we can make real progress in manned, unmanned teaming. Uh, and again, as you talked about, each one of our fleets is doing their own experimentation. So Fifth Fleet had Task Force 59, did a lot with maritime domain awareness. awareness. We pushed that down into Fourth Fleet, some additional work there. You know, Pack Fleet is doing uh, their own experimentation there. So the really great thing about it is you get all this creativity, all this innovation and all these ideas. But as you said, we do need to knit that all together uh, into a big concept of operations, do some more experimentation on that, and then figure out what are the capabilities we're going to really invest in, and again, how do we get them out to the fleet as quickly as possible. I think if you step back and you think about the interwar period where in the Navy we went up to the War College, we had our fleets go out and do the integrated battle problems, and then we learned a lot during that period. So I think is one of my 
objectives during this tour is to really be able to leverage the War College, uh, leverage all that experimentation, and then put together those concepts I talked about so we can better understand what are the capabilities we need to get that to the hands of the warfighters as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of, of rad, rather large unmanned vehicle, yeah. surface vehicle, underwater vehicle programs that have slowed recently, uh, LUSV, MUSV, XLUUV, uh, not moving as quickly as, as maybe was envi originally envisioned. Um, do they need to be sped up? And uh, um, also, in one of the things that we're, we're seeing in Ukraine uh, and, and other theaters is a move towards smaller drones. Um, the Army recently canceled its re recon helicopter because of sort of the greater uh, promise of, of these smaller drones. Does the Navy need to reconsider how it approaches uh, unmanned systems? So I think this is a, one of those yes and mm. situations where we do need the larger platforms that we've been developing. And you know where it does slow down, I think this is pretty complex technology. We want to work with industry to make sure that we can continue to learn on those space, into that space and be able to have, again, those platforms that we really are going to need uh, in the future. But that's a yes and. I think we do also need to focus on some of the smaller capabilities and even these disruptive take capabilities that our disruptive capabilities office is looking at, because I think you're going to need all of those things in the very complex battlefield in the future. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about one specific uh, situation. Everybody is is concerned with the possibility of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan and, you know, what the U.S. Navy could do in, in the Taiwan Strait should something like that occur. Um, Replicator is one thing that the Pentagon has, has brought up, the notion that we need many, many small drones. Uh, Admiral Preparo is proposing the, his hellscape idea with, again, many, many small drones. Um, does this sort of era of the small drones, many, cho many cheaper, uh, allow the Navy to think differently about things like the Virginia Class Block 5, the larger unmanned vehicles, you know, even FAXX? Well, again, I really think this is a yes and. You know, we really have to think, step back and think about the whole complex battlefield uh, that we're going to be fighting in alongside the joint force and with our allies and partners. And what are those best capabilities that we need to have both to deter our adversaries, which, of course, is job one, uh, you know, to deter them so we never have to fight a war is, uh, you know, something that we're very focused on. And then how do we have those capabilities like you talked about? Uh, to be able to get after any challenge that we face, regardless of where it is in mm -hmm. the world. Um, yes, and we'll probably take more money. And we're in a budget, famously in a budget-constrained environment. Um, the the Navy's recent uh, shipbuilding plans have seemed to pull back on procurement, increase ship retirements, uh, all these sorts of things, uh, because Congress isn't allowing a yes, and. Um, how do you choose in a resource-constrained environment? Well, I think any service chief has to look pretty hard at all of the things that they need to do. You know, we are designed and our Title X mission is to provide for combat operations incident to sea and also provide for the peacetime security of the nation. I think in a fiscally constrained environment in this decisive decade, you know, just like Admiral Gilday before me, I'm very focused on readiness and uh, making sure that we have ready platforms. I've talked a lot about getting more platforms on the field. Uh, every study since 2016 has said that we need a larger Navy, and we do, uh, but we also need a Navy that's ready to be able to do its job. So, you know, I focus on doing the things that we can do right now, and I am very focused on the industrial base, uh, both for the shipbuilding industrial base, for our weapons industrial base, and uh, making sure that we are making the investments that we need to make to be able to speed production, uh, to be able to get our ships in and out of maintenance on time. And again, I think that's how we're going to get more players on the field as quickly as possible. Okay. And one more yes, and you've, you've talked about war fighting. You've written about looking at everything with a war fighting lens. But at the same time, you talk about things that uh, happen in peacetime, protection, protecting uh, maritime commerce, all the things that uh, the Navy uniquely does. How do you balance uh, the Navy's war fighting role with its role in doing all the other things that, that Congress that charges the Navy alone with doing? Yeah, you know, at first, as I talked about earlier, being a global force is uh, very important to us and being forward is very important to us. And that always gives us an opportunity to provide a lot of different options uh, to the Secretary of Defense and, of course, to the President 
uh, to use us as a lever, as a tool in the tool bag for whatever our nation needs us to do to support our national security interests. But as far as training goes, I mean, our job, again, is to provide for combat operations. So as we look at our training objectives and the things we need to do, both with the Marine Corps, with the Joint Force, and with our allies and partners, I think when we focus on the high-end fight, uh, that's what we need to do first. And I think we can also do the peacetime missions, the national security missions, uh, as a subset of those based on the training that we're already doing, sort of through the building block approach from unit level training to integrated training to strike group training to big joint exercises. I think that prepares us really to do any mission we're asked to do. Okay. You also mentioned readiness as a big focus, and a lot of a lot of people talk about uh sort of the the life of a of a of a ship or a unit as 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 being a bathtub you you get ready and you're way up here and then you come back from your deployment and then you you your readiness slumps and then you spend some time down there and eventually you start working your way back up um your predecessor uh focused a lot on the shipyards uh, as as a a key driver of just how low that bathtub was and how much effort it took to get out of it again. Uh, what trends do you look at when you see readiness and think about this bathtub? Is um, you know what what needs to what needs to be better? Well, I would probably say two things, and I don't really look at it as a bathtub. Okay. Because we do really want our forces to be ready. We want our trail sailors to be trained and ready to do their jobs whenever they're called to do them. Uh, recognizing maintenance is a mission. Uh, just like deployment is a mission, I think that's a first thing that we need to do, which is to really define those work packages, get our ships modernized, get them maintained, get them back out there uh, as quickly as possible. And we do need to be able to do that. Um, I sec the second piece is something that's new really since I was a junior officer is the amount of simulation that we have available to our sailors uh, to be able to continue to do their training. And there's been a lot of investments in live virtual constructive training of individual simulators. So people can, even when they're in a maintenance period, go over and maintain some of their professional skills, their team skills. And I think that that will help us sustain that professional warfighting edge uh, when people are in a maintenance availability. Of course, we have plenty of opportunities for people to cross deck, you know, from a ship in the maintenance availability and get them out operational and learning uh, and bring that expertise back into their, into their ships, their submarines and their squadrons. Okay. Well, let, let's talk about people then. Um, the Navy is is doing well at retention, not doing so well with recruiting. It's a you know certainly is not a, a thing that's unique to the Navy. Uh, there are a couple of of initiatives that have been introduced over the past couple of years to address the recruiting uh, challenges. Um, you know what's what's coming up next? Uh, you know what? Uh, how how do you how do you address the challenge? Well, first, I'd say to have to say I'm really happy about our retention. We are doing well in retention, but it isn't something we can take for granted. And, you know, we know that our people are our secret weapon. They're our most important resource. And I'm very focused on making sure that they have a great quality of service. That's kind of a combination of a quality of life plus a combination of quality of work. And we've put together a cross-functional team of all stakeholders uh, led really by the Vice Chief of Naval Operations, reporting to myself and the Secretary of the Navy to really do a deep dive on what is it that people need uh, to be able to have all the resources they need both at work, uh, to be able to have a good work life, but also have that same quality of service uh, that they really appreciate. So we've taken a lot of initiatives. I've put 100% funding in the sustainment of our barracks. I'm very focused on making sure people have a quality place to live. Uh, I'm also putting 100% uh, into our gyms and fitness facilities, and we've also made them available 24 hours a day, again, because we know uh, people like to get out and work out to take care of themselves and recharge their batteries. Uh, we also know that Wi-Fi is really a necessity today, and uh, we want to try to make Wi-Fi accessible to everyone. So we have started a, a Wi-Fi pilot uh, in some of our barracks so we can see uh, what type of service is best for our sailors and how can we provide that to them as a utility. Um, when you think about barracks lives too, people really want to have access to high quality food. And we're making sure that now they can cook uh, in their rooms, uh, which is a new thing for us as well, of have access uh, to kitchen and uh, equipment. So again, people want to be able to take care of themselves. We know another uh, priority item for a lot of our sailors is childcare and high quality childcare. So we've made a lot of improvements in our ability to provide that childcare. We've invested in a lot of new CDCs. You'll see them in our budget. But more importantly than just the new facilities are making sure that we have trained a high quality staff to be able to man those facilities. So 
We've taken some steps over the last year to make sure that we attract good people who want to work in our CDCs uh, by paying them, uh, at least as much as they're getting paid in the outside area, for providing discounts for them for their own children uh, to be able to be in the CDCs while they're working, and also making sure that they have an incentive structure to stay with us, uh, that they can work in one CDC, but if they transfer to another area, they'll be able to get a job in another one. So again, these are some of the things we're doing to uh, help support our sailors have better quality of life, better quality of work, and stay on our Navy team. On the recruiting front, uh, this is the one thing that I'm very, very focused on beyond maintenance and getting more players on the field is about the players on the field that are our people. Um, you know, we got uh, 6,000 more sailors recruited last year in 2023 than we did in 2022. So that was actually moving in a positive direction. And the trends we're seeing this year, we're continuing to move in a positive direction. And we need to continue to pull every single lever available to us to make sure that people know what their Navy is doing for them every day, getting them to see that they could be a part of our team at their son or daughter or the person that they coach uh, would be a good fit for our team. So I'm excited to be able to tell that story. And I think our sailors do that best themselves. But we have put in place a lot of different initiatives uh, to be able to expand the pool of people who are eligible to join the team. And as long as they meet our high standards uh, and our qualifications that we require, I'm excited to have them there. But you could think of things like, how old are you? Are you 42? So if you were uh, up to your 42nd birthday, you could uh, still join our Navy team. So that is uh, bringing in more people. Uh, we've also taken a page from the Army, and we've stood up our uh, future sailor preparatory courses, both for physical fitness uh, and for academics. And the physical fitness one has basically seen 100% of those sailors go on to complete boot camp successfully meeting all of our standards. The academic one is designed to give them some, some more skills in math and in English, so they can perhaps pursue a lot of different rating choices in our Navy by raising their test scores. So that's another great uh, opportunity. I think another one is we have are taking people that do not have a high school diploma or a GED, but have an AFQT score of 50. Uh, and again, so they meet that requirement, a very high standard requirement, but for whatever reason, they weren't able to finish high school or get a GED. And uh, we're really excited about bringing those folks uh, onto the team as well. I think another piece, not just on the uh, initiative side, but some things that we've done internally, we've just put a two-star flag officer or about to put a two-star flag officer in charge of recruiting, uh, someone very experienced, who's gonna bring an enterprise look across the entire recruiting nation to uh, better understand what's going on at our small, medium, and large uh, centers and how we can flow resources differently to help our recruiters meet their goals uh, for their month. The other one is making sure we have enough recruiters out there. Those are also players on the field. We put a lot of those players out on our ships and uh, now we're pushing them back out into the field and uh, we're really excited about the opportunity that's gonna give us to get more reach and really, there's talent in every zip code. How are we getting to every zip code? How are we using our fleet weeks, our executive engagements to tell people about our story so they can see themselves in our team? Must be a, a difficult choice uh, to, to figure out whether you need a sailor on the ship doing his or her job or out there trying to bring in more sailors. Well, you know, if we don't have the sailors to bring in, we're not going to have the sailors on the ships that we need. So I think that has to be job one, uh, bringing in the best talent for our team every day. All right. I think we have just a few more minutes. Uh, it's budget season. The 30-year shipbuilding plan just came out. Um, you're you're obviously fairly new on the job, and so much of the planning for that 30-year plan uh, had, was already in place by the time it came out. Um, uh, is there anything you'd like to highlight from that? And also, given your warfighting focus, uh, what do you think the 30-year plans will be like for the rest of your, your, of your tour? Well, again, you know, the shipbuilding plan is, uh, is our vision of how we're going to get after that larger Navy, you know, that we need over time. It is a recognition uh, that there are really tough choices to be made with the budget that we have, with this Fiscal Responsibility Act. And, uh, you know, I think it represents uh, a good budget, a good shipbuilding plan to get after that. I think during my tenure, my job is going to be to really invest heavily in our defense industrial base, in our weapons industrial base, but really working with shipbuilding industry on workforce development, on getting the long lead time materials they need, on having the infrastructure they need to be able to really speed up uh, production that will help us procure uh, more ships, more submarines, 
and everything else we need in the future. So on the topic of defense industrial base, one way to invest is to buy ships and subs. Uh, do you have other things in mind? So, you know, we're making a lot of investments in the submarine industrial base. We also have our shipyard infrastructure optimization program going. And again, as I talk about foundation, these are things that we really need to invest in. The foundation of our American shipbuilding arsenal to be able to produce those ships and submarines that we need on a pace at which we need them. So submarines are one of our most important critical advantages that we have, and uh, we are really investing heavily. First, we're investing in the Columbia-class submarine, uh, the most survivable leg of the nuclear deterrent capability. Uh, we want to produce one Columbia submarine uh, per year, plus 2.33 Virginia-class submarines a year. And this will really get us up to the number of submarines that we want to have, as well as support our commitments uh, under the AUKUS agreement. So we're really excited about the opportunity to work with Australia, the UK, and ourselves to uplift the submarine industrial bases in all three countries, as well as develop other capabilities that we can uh, share together. So as far as the submarine industrial base goes, we're making extensive investments, working alongside industry to develop the workforce, provide training and certification programs, also to support infrastructure changes that will help them help us get our submarines out onto the field much faster. So it's it's easier to keep a good workforce than it is to build a good workforce. And so I'm, I'm thinking about the carriers. I, I believe the, the Navy's most recent plan adds time between uh, the furthest two out carriers. And that's, uh, it doesn't sound like a recipe for, for easily keeping a workforce. Um, is will the Navy be able to, to bring that back or or is that the way you think it should go? Well, you know, again, these are some of these hard choices that we need to make and I'm committed to working with you know, the administration, with Office of Secretary of Defense, with industry partners to understand how that best put that together. You know, I think you'll also see in the budget that we also provided some advanced procurement uh, for that. So we're gonna be able to keep the smaller suppliers uh, in the game. And uh, we know that that's a concern on industry's part. And uh, again, we want to get after that. All right. Well, Admiral Franchetti, thank you for sharing your time and your thoughts with us today. Uh, everybody, thank you for joining us. Please stay tuned for the rest of the State of the Navy. Next up is going to be Patrick Tucker talking to the commander of the U.S. Navy's Fourth Fleet. For Defense One, I'm Brad Penniston. <laughs>